helping them to make choices. Well, you know. You've got everything written from the morning you get up till the time you go to bed. Let your kids fly a little bit. Have fun. Laugh. I believe that if I were to do what you're saying, that my children may end up having living girlfriend. <laughs> I'm not letting the world dictate to me how to raise my kids. Jail was very, very hard. I mean, I many sleepless nights, just not being able to be around my family. I mean, only having 10 minute phone calls a week, like it was just hard and hearing my little sister on the phone, like it was just tough to deal with. I'm innocent. There was somebody else in the house that night and to know that this is something I'm being accused of just makes everything so much worse. What is it that make teenagers snap and become heartless killers who take the lives of their own family members? Could it be too much pressure put upon them by their family members? Could it be some sort of evil or sickness that they were just born with and had no control of? Or is it something else? The following stories tell the tale of three evil teens who killed their family. But is everything really all it seems? Stay tuned. believe Jacob Stockdale and killed his little brother James and their mother as well, then turned the weapon on himself. Could the pressure of having ultra strict and overprotective parents cause a seemingly perfect child to snap and do the unthinkable? That's what we're about to find out in this first story. You may have heard of the old television reality series Wife Swap. Basically, the premise of the show is that the wife and mother from one family switches places with a wife and mother from a different family that lives a completely different life from them. For two weeks, both of the wives and the families are matched up with and have to adjust to a whole new way of life. Sometimes this swap went well, while in other cases things got pretty heated and chaotic. While there were many episodes that featured some pretty opposite ways of life, few people could forget season 4 episode 15 of the show that aired in April of 2008. This particular episode featured the Stockdale family and the Taconvic family. Lori Taconvic was a very laid back mom from Illinois, who mostly let her children do what they wanted. And then there was Kathy Stockdale, who lived on a farm in the country with her husband Tim and four sons. The Stockdale kids were very sheltered, very conservative, and very unusual bunch compared to most their age. Dales are devoutly religious. Praise the Lord for he is kind. Amen. I don't think my parents would allow me to listen to pop. I have never been on a date. There's better ways to find out about girls than dating. I have not kissed a girl in a romantic way. There were four boys in the Stockdale family, ranging from 11 to 19 years old. Their names were Calvin, Charles, Jacob, and James. The boys had a long list of rules that they were expected to follow at all times. Not allow any cussing. Aw, oh, rats. I think that dating has uh, physical dangers like pregnancy. It's not worth it. And the boys are also homeschooled in order to control their influences. It's important we have control over their character and their education. The Stockdale family. Together, the family was very musical and often played in competitions. If the boys wanted to earn privileges, they were required by their parents to complete chores from a chore chart. The Takanovic family was pretty much opposite of the Stockdales in almost every way. They hardly had any rules and they definitely allowed dating. In fact, they even considered their children's significant others to be part of the family. It's not surprising that when Lori read the instruction manual that Kathy had left behind, she was shocked by how many rules were included as part of running the family. She asked the boys about what they thought about how things were done around the home. Have you ever thought about dating? Uh, I think I should wait for time when I can settle down. If you saw a beautiful girl walking down the road, wouldn't you think, oh man, I'd like to take her out on a date? Um, that might be a first reaction, but second thought, no. Clearly, the parents had gotten into these boys' heads. Even the older children didn't seem to have much interest in things that teen boys would be into. It would be hard for anyone watching not to wonder how these young men were ever going to be able to grow up and have normal lives when they were so sheltered. How do they find somebody to marry without dating? Unless it's an arranged marriage and 
The way they're living, I wouldn't be surprised. Even the smallest, most simple enjoyment of life, like listening to the radio, had to be earned through housework and other chores. The boys pay 20 tokens to listen to a radio show. It's important to instill in our children that you need to work and not expect to have a handout. The work I have to do is sweep the porch, sweep all the downstairs, clear the table, unload the dishwasher. It's kind of boring after a while. And it wasn't like the boys even got to choose what kind of program they got to listen to on the radio anyway, even after they had done all that work. Listen to the radio? Yeah. Mm, who something. picks those? Ron does. Oh, this is great. This is 100 tokens, right? Yeah. And that's okay with you. I would rather not have to do the tokens to get like a radio show. Just like a lot of the people watching, Lori was pretty horrified. She even said that she believed that the Stockdale boys were being treated like slaves. She felt that they needed to have some sort of say in how they were going to grow up. She ended up confronting Tim about this. You're not allowing them to make choices. Well, you know. You've got everything written from the morning you get up till the time you go to bed. Let your kids fly a little bit. Have fun, laugh. I believe that if I were to do what you're saying, that my children may end up having living girlfriend. I'm not letting the world dictate to me how to raise my kids. It became clear pretty quickly that no matter what Lori said to Tim, nothing was going to get through to him. He was far too stuck in his ways. I certainly believe she loves her children, but I love my children too. And if they do something wrong, I can say, you know, I love you, but I don't love the thing you're doing right now and I want you to stop. And I don't know that she's ever done that. Meanwhile, the Stockdale boys were so used to lives filled with rules, regulations, and schedules that they couldn't even imagine what a life of freedom would be like. So you like having everything just scheduled out for you? Yeah, it's, it's nice because I know what I have to do next. What would, so you, just what like, would you do if you didn't have a schedule? Like, just like not anything, doing work? Anything, no um, work. I would have a lot more free time. To do what? Play around with my brothers. In the weeks and months after the episode aired, there was a lot of chatter about the Stockdale family, but eventually things quieted down. That is until 2017 when they were back in the news again, but this time due to an unthinkable tragedy. It all started when law enforcement received a 911 call from the Stockdale family residence. Uh, yesterday afternoon at about 4.36 p.m., our office received a 911 call from the residence. It was a landline call, not a cell phone call. It was a hang-up call. Um, at that time, after we received the hang-up call, which we do in a number of cases on a daily basis, we responded deputies to the residence. Law enforcement showed up at the house and found the front door open. They called out to see if anyone was home, but didn't get any response. That's when they heard a loud bang ring out. Someone had just used a firearm. They were about to find out that they walked onto a murder scene. They uh, tactically approached the house uh, when some backup arrived and discovered that the suspect, uh, Jacob Stockdale, had uh, attempted and, and shot himself at, uh, when they arrived. Um, they also discovered two victims in the home, 54-year-old uh, Catherine Barbara Stockdale and 21-year-old James William Stockdale. Jacob Stockdale, who was 25 years old at the time, had killed both his mother and his youngest brother. Then he attempted to take his own life. Uh, deputies continue to investigate the case along with the Stark County Coroner's Office. Uh, once we have more information available on the case, we will provide it to you. Currently, um, the suspect, Jacob Stockdale, is in Cleveland Metro in critical care. It seemed like the whole thing had happened out of nowhere. Had there been any signs in recent years? Law enforcement said no. Any run-ins with Jacob prior to this incident? Maybe no, ma'am. Not related to the house? None at all. You haven't been there, no run-ins, anything? Uh, it seems like a really nice, wholesome family. What are you looking at from yeah, any motive yet at this point? You know, it's hard to, you know, kind of surmise what the motive may have been. Um, you know, there's, there's some speculation. Um, don't really want to get into that. Part of it. it seemed like the only person who could really answer the many questions involved with this case was Jacob, but he was still clinging on to life in the hospital. A lot of unanswered questions for us yet that we're still peeling back the layers. 25-year-old Jacob Stockdale survived what cops are calling a self-inflicted shotgun blast to the head. 
He's in critical condition in the hospital. Jacob ended up being treated and surviving. He had to go to several surgeries to repair the damage he had inflicted on himself and his face was left disfigured. He was arrested and charged on two counts of murder. News of what happened in the Stockdale family home spread quickly and shocked the nation. But there were still very few details about what had actually gone down. Why had Jacob done this? Some people wondered if it was because of the strange sheltered life that the boys had been forced into that caused Jacob to act out in this brutal act of violence. Others wondered if it could have to do with the pressure of all the performing the family did. As was asked, we had never uh, had a reason to be called to that residence in the past. So we don't have anything in our our CAD or any information that we'd been there in the past. So. The press ended up reaching out to Lori to convict to hear what her response was to this shocking news. Surprisingly, Lori claimed that as soon as she heard the news, she knew who had to be behind the murder. When you first heard about what happened to the Stockdale family, what was your reaction? I actually, when my son called me to tell me what had happened, um, he didn't know who the shooter was. I knew immediately. You knew in your heart that it was Jacob? Yeah. Following the murders of Kathy and Joshua, the family mourned the losses in written statements. They remembered Kathy for her devotion to her family and her faith, and Joshua for being a source of family fun and a talented musician. Joshua and Kathy's funerals were held together on the same day. Stark County now with an update on that double murder investigation. Danny? Well, that's right, Ramona. You can see that it's quiet here now at the Stockdale family home. It's just about 24 hours since the Stark County Sheriff's Department responded here and that they say that they found 25-year-old Jacob Stockdale, a three-time Ohio State fiddle champion with a, an apparent self-inflicted gun wound and his mom and brother dead in the home. Now that Jacob had survived his attempt on his life, he would have to face the court system and there was a good chance that he would be looking at life in prison. His only chance to avoid that may be to try to go with an insanity defense. In this particular case, there's been a report that has been filed in this case and just to walk through it by Dr. Ariane Gargantula Woods. It's her opinion based on a reasonable psychological certainty that you are not suffering from a severe mental defect at this time of the charge. Professionals initially came to the conclusion that Joshua was not insane. So we have this report, we've done the competency, we've done several competency evaluations, we've now done the uh, sanity evaluation. We have a trial scheduled for May 4th of this year. Joshua's defense team claimed that more tests needed to be done to see how competent he really was. I'm also going to be filing the not guilty by reason of insanity plea and ask the court to order the appropriate evaluations for that plea also. After the next round of psychological evaluations, Jacob ended up getting placed in a mental facility. It was decided that he would stay there until it could be determined whether or not he would be able to stand trial. While he was inside the facility, Jacob tried to escape not once, but twice. And by the end of February of 2020, the judge ended up deciding that he was mentally competent enough to finally face trial. The following year, four years after the murders took place, Jacob ended up confessing to killing both his mom and little brother. He was sentenced to 15 years for each of the murders. The earliest that it would be possible for him to ever get out of prison would be during the year 2048. Do you think the sentence of 30 years total behind bars was a fair decision? Some people think it was too strict and that Jacob had already been living a life of imprisonment since childhood due to his parents' extreme parenting method. There were clearly a lot of dark secrets going on behind the scenes with this family, but we may never know what ultimately caused this sheltered kid to finally snap. Let us know what you think about this in the comments. This case is an older one that took place back in Alberta, Canada during 2006. It's a disturbing one that shows just what a bad influence and the belief in evil can do to a teenager. 12-year-old Jasmine Richardson lived in Alberta, Canada with her dad, Mark, her mom, Deborah, and her eight-year-old brother, Tyler Jacob. Even though she was just a kid, Jasmine was dating a 23-year-old man named Jeremy Allen Steinecke. Creepy, right? Jasmine's parents ended up finding out about her 
threatening relationship with a much older man and did what they thought was best to try to put a stop to it. They grounded their daughter. But like most tween girls, Jasmine still found ways to talk to him. Jeremy was not the kind of person any parent would want their young daughter around. Not only was he way older than her, but he also had a weird obsession with things like vampires and murder. He convinced Jasmine that they couldn't let her parents keep them apart. On the afternoon of April 23rd, 2006, the bodies of Mark, Deborah, and Tyler were found inside their family home. They had all been brutally killed with a knife. There was no sign of Jasmine. At first, people were worried that she could also be in danger and had been taken somewhere else. But in reality, it was her and Jeremy who committed these murders. They were later found and placed under arrest. Because Jasmine was still underage when the murders happened, the news outlets and publications at the time couldn't publicly identify her. It wasn't until years later that it was revealed what happened to her after the murders. She was sentenced to 10 years behind bars as well as some time in a psychiatric facility. She was able to still attend school while in prison. Jeremy, on the other hand, was given three consecutive life sentences in December of 2008. Do you think it's fair that Jasmine was given a second chance because she was so young at the time of the crime? Let us know what you think in the comments. I can't even put it in words. Sometimes I'm having to grab my brain and just ask God to give me wisdom, give me peace, give me my mind. This last story took place in Houston, Texas on July 29th of 2016. Your name? AJ. Police found the couple shot at a home on Palmetto and Maple Ridge Street. A heartbreaking turn of events. There have been people coming and going in and out of the house to find out what happened here. Don and Antonio Armstrong Sr. were found to death on July 29th at their home on Palmetto. The Armstrongs were a well-off and well-respected family who prided themselves in their work ethic. Antonio Armstrong Sr. was a former NFL player. After his retirement from football, he became a motivational speaker and owned a chain of gyms. He and his wife, Dawn Armstrong, worked hard to give the best possible lives to their three children, Antonio Jr., Joshua, and Kyra. The children went to nice private schools and they would regularly go on luxurious vacations. The only thing their parents asked them in return was to work hard in school and to make the most of the opportunities they had given them. From the outside looking in, this looked to be the perfect family. They seemed to really have it all together. But then tragedy struck and the world would soon find out that there was more going on than what met the eye. It all began when law enforcement received a 911 call from Antonio Armstrong Jr. in the middle of the night. The 911 call, he's very calm. It's a 16 minute call and maybe it's, it may be the most calm 911 I've ever heard in my career. And your name? AJ. AJ tells the dispatcher that he heard the sound of a firearm going off two times. Any medical attention needed? I, I heard three shots, so I don't really know. I went down the stairs, saw a crack in my parents' door and I immediately called y'all. Law enforcement arrived at the scene right away, and they discovered both Antonio Sr. and Don had been brutally unalived. AJ Jr., his brother Joshua, and his little sister Kyra were not harmed. Officers found both parents in their bedroom before two o'clock this morning. So one of the first officers who got on scene, got inside, found the Armstrongs in their bed, and looked at some of the evidence there. They radioed down and said, hey, separate. AJ and his sister. Once he was with law enforcement, they decided to ask AJ some more questions. They were the most interested in what he had to say since he was the one who discovered his parents. I was making my way down the stairs and that's when I heard the gunshots when I got like four or five stairs down and I like looked. Yeah, how many you heard? How many you heard? I mean, I think I heard two, but it may have been three. I'm not really like like 100% positive, but like I knew, I know it's two or three. Here's where things started to get even more bizarre. AJ tells detectives that he saw a stranger in the house that night who was wearing a mask. And like I saw someone like coming out, so I just took off back upstairs. They had a, uh, it was like a mask, and like you could only see the eyes and the mouth. But he looked like it. He looked like a black guy. But I'm not like 100% positive. At this point, detectives are starting to get a little suspicious. Why would he have waited until now to tell them about the masked man? Why wouldn't he have told a dispatcher that when he called 911? But this was only the beginning of the inconsistencies in his story. AJ would also tell law enforcement that after he heard the firearm go off, he hadn't looked inside his parents' bedroom, but already knew they had been killed. The only way he could have known this without actually looking 
thing was if he was the one who had killed them. Detectives suspected AJ was behind the murders from the beginning, even though many people who knew his family didn't want to believe it. When they investigated the scene, they found a hole in the ceiling of the Armstrong parents' bedroom. The hole had been made from a firearm, and it was coming from AJ Jr.'s room. They asked him to try to explain why this was there. He told them that a couple of weeks before, when he had some friends over, they had been playing around with AJ Sr.'s weapon, and it went off. He goes on to swear that he didn't have anything to do with at all his parents' murders. But unfortunately for him, there was more evidence that would come about that was going to make him look even more guilty. There was an alarm system in the Armstrong house that included motion sensors in the hallway. Just 30 minutes before AJ ended up calling 911 on the night of the murders, there was a motion indicating that someone had walked between AJ's bedroom and his parents' bedroom. Eventually, law enforcement had enough evidence to charge AJ with his parents' murders, but it would still be a challenge to convince a jury that this young man was guilty. Don and Antonio would have wanted me to have taken care of AJ. Antonio Armstrong Jr. always said an intruder killed his parents, not him. You don't have to trust us. You can trust Antonio Sr. who called him a liar and a schemer. But he's still 16. And that crime scene just speaks like a 16 year old did it. As it would turn out, AJ did have a possible motive for killing his parents. Before their deaths, AJ and his parents were not on great terms. They were really disappointed in AJ for not living up to his potential. He had been getting in trouble and wasn't working hard in school. His dad sent him a text message expressing his disappointment not long before the murders. AJ, really bro, I just don't get it. Zeros, missing assignments, emails from teachers. I am tired, really tired, nothing left to say. Dawn had also also sent a similar message. We gave you all the best we had. We wanted the best for you. We provided the best education, bought you a great car to celebrate you. We tried to be open with you and what was important to you. And all you do is lie to us, scheme behind our backs, choose to bleep on all we tried to do, beyond disappointed. I will never understand why you are a liar and do not work hard in school. You do not want to be right or do good. I am so heartbroken, but it is what it is. In 2017, it was determined that AJ, now charged with murder, would be tried with an adult. After spending months in custody, he is released on a $200,000 bond, but required to wear an ankle monitor. He would later emotionally talk publicly about how hard those eight months behind bars were. Jail was very, very hard. I mean, I many sleepless nights, just not being able to be around my family. I mean, only having 10 minute phone calls a week, like it was just hard and hearing my little sister on the phone, like it was just tough to deal with. He also talked about what it felt like to be blamed for his own parents' murders. It's not even the fact of just dealing with not having my parents anymore. It's the fact that I'm being accused of something of this magnitude. Still, he stuck by the same story that he always had about there being an intruder in the family home that tragic night. I'm innocent. There was somebody else in the house that night and to know that this is something I'm being accused of, just makes everything so much worse. Was it possible that AJ was innocent? After all, his DNA hadn't been found on what was believed to have been the murder weapon. But at the same time, there were absolutely no signs of a break-in, which makes his story about an intruder not really add up either. So what was the truth? The trial dragged on for a long time, and then out of nowhere, a very unexpected twist happened. A woman named Maxine Adams came forward, and she had been a friend of both Don and Antonio Sr. She claimed that Antonio Antonio Sr. had a secret and that he had been involved in an illegal crime ring and had even been receiving death threats before his murder. Maxine's husband had also been involved with the criminal activity, and while she had been hesitant to come forward, she wanted to be sure that detectives were at least aware that this secret group had been going on. Be completely two independent things, but because it was the one, con it's the one connection. Mm -hmm. It is the one connection between all of them. So not only had Antonio Sr. been involved in illegal activity, but he had been receiving death threats right before he and his wife were discovered murdered? It would seem like this should be a reason enough to reinvestigate the case and reconsider Antonio Jr.'s charges. At least that's what AJ's grandmother Kay thought. You mean to tell me that wasn't enough for you to start investigating? Not only was Kay dealing with the fact that her grandchild was charged with murder, she was finding out family secrets that she could have never imagined. It's painful, but I want to know truth and I want my grandson free. 
whatever it takes to free my grandson. I just want the truth and I want everybody involved to do their job. But somehow still, even after this interruption, the case against AJ went on. He's stuck with his plea of not guilty. The case went to the jury and by April 24th, it was time for them to make their deliberations. But just days into the deliberations, the judge declared a mistrial and the case date was reset. The second trial began in October of 2022. Yet again, the case was declared a mistrial after the jury could not come to a unanimous decision. The case was reset for a final time for 20 2023, but this time the jury did reach a verdict. Seven years after the murders of his parents, AJ was convicted and life as he knew it was changed forever. We the jury find the defendant Antonio Armstrong Jr. guilty of capital murder. It is now the order of this court that you be sentenced to life with the possibility of parole after 40 calendar years. You'll be transported by the sheriff to that institution where you will serve out the remainder of life and you'll get credit for all of your back time. Good luck to you, sir. Angel's legal team had grown very close to him throughout the years and watched as he grew from a teenager to an adult. They truly believed that he was innocent and were very disappointed by the verdict. How do you all feel right now? Uh, it's absolutely devastating. AJ is grown up with us. As I said in my closing over the last seven years, we've seen him grown up from a 16 year old to a young man, father, husband. Um, it's devastating. AJ's grandmother spoke out after the verdict and sentencing. She said the decision brought her the opposite of any sort of peace. The mere fact that somebody could think that now the Armstrongs can rest in peace, shame on you. A grandmother standing by her grandson despite a guilty verdict. I would just like to say I know right now, without a shadow of a doubt, that AJ is not guilty. Is it possible that the jury could have gotten this one wrong? Let us know what you think in the comments. Thanks for watching and don't forget to subscribe for more.